I rise today to speak to Bill S-233, an act to develop a national framework for a guaranteed livable basic income. Or rather, I rise today to speak to the viral misinformation and disinformation about this bill and to confront some of the near delusional paranoia circulating on social media about it. For weeks now, our Senate email and voicemail boxes have been overwhelmed by thousands of messages from angry, frightened Canadians. Canadians who are outraged by S-233, or at least by the lies that they have been told about S-233. There are so many desperate letters sent to us by people who've been manipulated and terrified into believing outrageous conspiracy theories. There are letters from people who believe S-233 to be a fascist plot, a communist plot, a Masonic plot, an eugenics plot, a Jewish plot, a plot by the World Economic Forum or the World Health Organization, a sinister scheme orchestrated by Choose Your Choice, Klaus Schwab, or George Soros, or Bill Gates, or the ever-popular Illuminati. Many believe Bill S-233 to be the first step on the path to one world government, or the new world order, or to a system of state social surveillance, such as the one the Chinese government in Beijing calls social credit. Others are convinced the bill contains provisions for digital ID or digital currency that will allow the government to track and control us all. This, my friends, is no accident. I believe there is an organized campaign afoot to spread destructive propaganda about Bill S-233, targeted online fear-mongering specifically designed to terrorize frightened seniors and those with disabilities to scare vulnerable Canadians into believing their pensions and disability benefits are about to disappear. It is a campaign purpose-built to erode public trust, not just in this government, but in Canadian democracy itself. Take this tweet posted on March 11th by Peter Terrace, a former Ontario candidate for the People's Party of Canada. And I quote, Bill S-233 is currently waiting for third reading in the Senate, in capital letters. If passed, it will be made law, which means if you are not vaccinated, you will not receive EI, CPP, OHS, social services, or pension that you paid into. That post alone has been retweeted almost a thousand times, and pretty much every single word of it is untrue. Bill S-233 is not a government bill. It is not at third reading, and even if we were to pass it, we all know it would not become law, not right away. It would, of course, be sent to the other place for more debate and study. This bill absolutely does not make the payment of a guaranteed basic income contingent on your vaccination status. Indeed, under the terms of Senator Pate's proposal, there would be no such type of social virtue testing or qualification for the receipt of such an income at all. Nor would a basic income take the place of employment insurance, workers' compensation insurance, the Canada Pension Plan, nor any other company or private pension. Even if we passed Bill S-233, it wouldn't create a guaranteed basic income. All the bill really does is call upon the government to consider how it might create a framework for how a possible future guaranteed basic income program might work. Nonetheless, Twitter and Facebook and Reddit and YouTube are filled with posts that repeat word for word the same falsehoods as the tweet I just read you. Many of the letters and phone calls we've received, though, go much further than fears about pensions. Some express concern that once Canadians become dependent on a guaranteed basic income, the government will be able to leverage that dependency to force people to conform. For example, here's an extended excerpt from an email I received on March 16th. Quote, I suspect that a guaranteed livable basic income creates a dependency upon government and lays down a foundation for creating digital identities tied to bank accounts and all other government agencies, both federal and provincial. Over time, abusive controlling powers would be assumed and invoked by dictatorial means. We would then be locked into a social credit system that is fascist, communistic, and totalitarian, thereby erasing the standards of democracy, our constitution, the rule of law, and our guaranteed rights and freedoms. An email from March 23rd mined a similar vein. Quote, there will be more vaccines to take and other medical procedures the government wants you to undergo. If you don't comply with just one of them, your accounts will be closed and you won't be able to buy food. You won't be able to do anything, not even work. 
One recent email suggested Bill S233 was part of what it called, quote, the sinister plan for humanity under a new world order and one world government, starting with John D. Rockefeller's Masonic creed. The letter went on to link Bill S233 to a long-term worldwide plot that included the assassinations of Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy. Other messages link Bill S233 with transhumanism, a concern which is not, as I had first assumed, about gender identity, but about an alleged plot to turn us all into bionic cyborgs. Quote, the transhumanist war has begun. We are now experiencing the long-awaited planning of the sociopathic elite as Klaus Schwab unleashes a world domination plan with the intent of changing the face of humanity forever, said one. S233 is just the beginning, wrote another correspondent. We are losing our freedoms to a group of elites who want to depopulate and control mankind, enslave us to experimental transhumanism, and the removal of any Christian and godly devotions. A common theme that runs through many letters is a persistent paranoia about the World Economic Forum, a belief that Justin Trudeau and Christian Freeland are subject to the control of German-Swiss economist Klaus Schwab. Many seem to believe that Schwab's agents have infiltrated the government and that Schwab, who's best known for throwing parties for plutocrats in Davos, is somehow simultaneously both a communist and a Nazi. This excerpt from a letter I received March 10th is pretty typical. Quote, nobody voted for Nazi Klaus Schwab. Nobody even knew he existed two years ago. He has done nothing for, he has nothing to do with Canada or any other country. Schwab holds a statue of Lenin in his office. This is not Canada. We are not going back to Nazi Germany. Please see the Nuremberg Code and trials. Other letters accuse senators and the Senate outright of treason. Quote, this is Canada, not North Korea, not Russia. You are employees of the people, not employees of the WEF or the WHO, reads an email I received March 6th. And just this afternoon, we probably all received the same email, was a letter that claimed that the adoption of a guaranteed basic income would lead to the forced sterilization of Canadians of childbearing age and the killing off of the elderly and the disabled. I must say, though, that many other letters are not from conspiracy theorists or anti-vaxxers at all. They are simply and heartbreakingly heartfelt notes from ordinary Canadian seniors and relatives of seniors who truly believe that this bill will steal their CPP and private pensions. As senators, we're all used to receiving angry letters and calls, but this campaign is qualitatively different. Three years ago, my inbox was full of very angry mail about bills C-69 and C-48, but even when some of those concerns were hyperbolic, exaggerated, they were based on fact, on the actual content of those bills. The campaign against S233 is something entirely different. It is a shadow war, concocted and orchestrated to protest something that doesn't even exist. Now, some of you may worry that by reading these letters into the Hansard record, I'm giving these theories undeserved attention. But we cannot ignore the elephant in the room. We must call out these myths and lies. So let us be clear. There is nothing in Bill S233 that would require any Canadian to be vaccinated or medicated. There is nothing in Bill S233 that relates to digital ID or digital tracking or digital currency. There is nothing in Bill S233 that is in any way akin to the Chinese social credit surveillance model. Senator Kim Pate, who has spent her entire adult life advocating for the civil rights of the vulnerable, the marginalized, and the forgotten, is not an agent of Klaus Schwab. She is not part of a globalist elite, nor a Davos hobnob. And as her long record of public service attests, she is the last person who'd ever want to see a single Canadian lose a pension or a job, and that's why her bill does nothing of the kind. Also, I'm pretty sure I can attest personally that Senator Tate is not hell-bent on turning us all into cybernetic transhumans. I'm, I'm right about that, yes? Yeah, okay. Now, many of the concerns of our many correspondents are perfectly valid and based in fact. Some have argued that a guaranteed basic income would sap productivity and reward shirkers for doing nothing or lead to labor shortages. Now, you might not agree, but that's a perfectly rational critique. Some have argued that Canada's COVID-battered economy could not afford such a program. 
I'd counter that it's entirely possible a well-designed program might actually save money, streamlining the number of social welfare support programs we have in this country. But an argument about possible costs is again perfectly reasonable. Some correspondents have raised legitimate questions about the bill, which I happen to share. The bill proposes to extend a guaranteed basic income to those 17 and up. And while I understand the logic of supporting emancipated teens or teens who fled abusive families, most 17-year-olds don't need a basic income. Nor can I agree with Senator Pate's proposition to pay guaranteed basic income to non-Canadians, such as temporary foreign workers. I have my own constitutional concerns as an Albertan about setting up such a federal income framework without the full cooperation, support, and buy-in of the provinces and First Nations. And we also need to be mindful of inflationary pressures a basic income might create, especially in overheated rental markets such as Vancouver and Toronto. So yes, it is perfectly possible to have a good faith, rational debate about the pros and cons of the universal basic income and the pros and cons of Senator Pate's particular suggested model. But it is next to impossible to have that debate while Canadian citizens, especially seniors and those with disabilities, are being subjected to a relentless campaign of online psychological terrorism. I have tried to use Twitter and Facebook to dispel the myths about this bill. I have tried to answer letters from people who just seem honestly confused. One woman I'll call Missy was so frightened by what she'd heard about Bill S-233, she told me she was thinking of leaving Canada. After I explained what S-233 actually said, she thanked me. You have truly helped me, she wrote back. I will do my best to spread what you have told me. It's scary how convincing this can be. I admit I fell for it and fed into it at times. She added, it's scary to live in fear every day. And that, of course, is the point of this whole disinformation campaign, to create fear and distrust, to keep people scared and vulnerable, and to erode our social contract and social fabric, our confidence in our fellow Canadians, replacing it with suspicion bordering on paranoia. The purpose of this strategy isn't to defeat S-233, which has only the smallest chance of becoming law anyway. No, it's to whip up a hysterical frenzy to convince ordinary Canadians, decent, caring Canadians like Missy, that their political leaders and their political institutions are not to be trusted. And then to trick and con ordinary, caring people, just like Missy, into sharing this fake information with their families, their faith communities, or their friends on Facebook. Rebutting these insidious campaigns is not easy. Although I did connect with Missy, I had less luck with a more recent correspondent. She wrote to me this weekend that she could not sleep over her fears that Canadian seniors would lose their pensions. When I tried to explain that S233 just wouldn't do that, she accused me of gaslighting her and demanded that I never contact her again. In her excellent essay published recently by The Line, conservative strategist Melanie Paradis coined a perfect phrase for these corrosive disinformation campaigns. She called them thought scams. She likened them to those Nigerian prince letters we all used to get, which tried to con us out of our money. But these thought scammers aren't primarily interested in getting rich. They are interested instead in stealing our faith and our trust, in stealing our Canada. And if we too fall prey, if we start demonizing our political opponents, portraying them as treasonous and corrupt, then we forfeit our ability as senators to have any good faith debates over vital public policy questions. So today, my friends, mes chers collègues, I am asking you to join me in standing up to the thought scammers. I ask you not to give a wink or a shrug or a smirk when you see one of these thought scams spreading because you think it might help your side or your team in the short term. I ask all of us here to stand united today not in full-throated support of Bill S-233, but in united support of truth, of reason, and of Canadian democracy itself. We in the Senate of Canada must stand as a bulwark against the tide of lies. We can, and my friends, we must. Thank you, merci, and hi hi. We have uh, 25 seconds left, so uh, there was a few senators that wanted to ask you questions, but we were actually out of time.
Agree. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Kutcher. <laughs> thank you very much, Ms. Madam Speaker. Uh, Senator, th thank you very much for uh, your uh, extremely passionate and, and, and well uh, conducted and well thought through speech on, on, this, on this issue. There, there certainly uh, seems to be a coordinated uh, disinformation campaign specifically around Bill uh, S-233, but it's not the only one that we are seeing, uh, Bill C-67 being one, which isn't even in federal parliament. But um, in addition to the conspiracy theories that have infiltrated all this communication, there has been uh, increasing concern recently, although this has been going on for some time now, about the role of malicious state actors, particularly Russia, in initiating much of this kind of campaign uh, or in amplifying uh, campaigns that are currently un uh, underway uh, with the clear intent of destabilizing uh, democratic institutions. Uh, you mentioned some ideas that we need to, as parliamentarians, be involved in addressing this. Are there any specific things that you can share with us that you think that parliamentarians should be doing to address these kind of disinformation campaigns? Senator Simons. Thank you very much, Senator Kutcher. You know, as a child of the Cold War, it seems strange to me to stand in the Senate of Canada and talk about Russian plots. I mean, it seems like something from a Cold War movie. I wouldn't have thought that that was plausible until we saw the reporting in the United States about Russian actors manipulating Facebook to create mob mentalities, creating both fake Republican pages and fake Democrat pages, and then setting the pages against each other. So I think it's incumbent upon us, first of all, as citizens, all of us, not just senators, to practice what I call social media hygiene. Don't share something if you don't know where it's from or what it is. The more outrageous and, and anger-provoking the post, the less likely it is to be true. And I would also say that sometimes I've seen people retweeting stuff that they know is nonsense, ironically, or to call it out. Don't do that. Because when you share things and interact with them, the algorithm doesn't know that you're hate-sharing. The algorithm just thinks, oh, people want to see that. So be very careful in how you use social media in the sense of, you know, we talk about safe sex, practice safe tweeting. <laughs> but I think it's also incumbent upon us to think in an age in which so many people get their information filtered through social media platforms about what the correct responsibility of those platforms should be and what our responsibility should be as legislators to ensure that not that we're, not that we're censoring debate, that we're providing some kind of, you know, Brita filter for the information so that all the lies do not get the algorithmic juice to rise to the top. And I think it's fair to ask uh, the major platforms, whether that's Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or, you know, the, 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 all the new ones that come along, what their protocols are to guard against malicious campaigns by foreign actors, which are clearly designed to poison democratic debate in Western democracies. We have two other senators just wanting to question Senator Lankin. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And Senator Simons, uh, thank you. Another eloquent tour de force speech by you, and it's much appreciated. Um, I particularly like the um, phrase that you brought forward from the conservative strategist uh, about a thought scam. Um, I'll elevate my language because I've been calling it a bot scam. And quite frankly, uh, it's not just 233. This began uh, immediately following the uh, uh, occupation that took place in Ottawa, and it involved uh, uh, communications uh, legislation that you're just referring to and, and others. Uh, it is absolutely clear to me that a large majority of these have been um, electronically generated. When they come in a thousand at a time um, and they have very similar themes, you know those are not individuals. I have also reached out to where it appeared to be a genuine and individual uh, person to, uh, to discuss, to tell them my views, to tell them what I think the reality is. Uh, but the other ones, any I've tried to reach, there is no reaching. There 
because there is no person. Um, this is uh, fundamentally uh, an issue of an undermining of democracy. Do you, Senator Simons, think there is, beyond our individual act actions, a collective response from the Senate um, that should be taken? The leaders of the various groups in the Senate, some of whom... I'm sorry, yes? time has elapsed. Senator Simons, Thank you. time has elapsed.